Okay, let's go ahead and start our last session. Um, kudos to the brave ladies that made it and to everybody that is still here. So this section is Sustainable Solutions, Regional Resources Recovery in Central Idaho, Oregon. And the speakers are Christina Devenport. Christina recently joined Brandon Caldwell as an integrated resource planning leader with a focus on industrial pretreatment, resource recovery and reuse. She has 20 years of experience developing and managing public and environmental health programs for local and state government. Most recently, as, <clears throat> as the industrial pretreatment manager for the city of Penn, where she regulated a thriving brew brewing industry. She understands the complexity of industrial waste, waste, including regulatory and public health challenges, and is passionate about finding unique solutions to reduce constituents in water while finding beneficial reuse options. Her priority is to consider community holistically with a triple bottom line approach involving all potential stakeholders changing ways to resources and creating opportunities to re reduce rates while protecting the environment. I'm Brittany Parks. Brittany is a chemical and environmental engineer specializing in project management, troubleshooting, and operations of wastewater treatment facilities. At the beginning of her career, she managed industrial water systems, including a 28 MGD treatment plant. Later, she managed waste, cap waste capital improvements projects at the city of Penn. Now she is the project manager for Leeway Engineering Solutions, working on an array of water infrastructure projects. Through her exp experience managing multiple disciplinary teams for projects, Brittany has developed a collaborative approach to design a pro uh, design and project management, resulting in, project, in projects that are built to perform for the whole life cycle. From the start of the design to project start, start up and operations, she will deliver projects that are cost-effective and sensible to build and maintain. It's the last uh, session, so I cannot read anymore. <laughs> Hi, so welcome. Thanks for sticking in here till the end to see our presentation, best for luck. So we're talking about sustainable solutions and resource recovery, hot topic right now, and going beyond just water reuse. I know that's been a huge topic. So here we're going to talk a little bit beyond water into other, um, other sources that we can reuse. So a little bit first, anyone that doesn't know Bend, Oregon. So this is a picture of our old mill district and you can kind of see the mountains in the background. We're on the east side of the Cascades. So a little bit different environment than most people think of Oregon. High desert, sagebrush and juniper. So very dry, we don't get a lot of rainfall. We have about 313 days of sunshine, they say. Um, great ski mountain nearby. And we also have a thriving brew industry. So we currently have 24 breweries. Um, we also have a good cannabis industry. I think it's got the same number of cannabis distributors as well. So it's a, it's a cool town to come to, um, to visit. We also have a lot of restaurants because we're a tourist destination. So a typical mountain town where you have a ski mountain nearby. And the tourism has really switched to year round. So that kind of plays into our resource recovery here. So what I'm talking about resource recovery, trying to change the perception of waste products to resources. Everything can be a resource. So just, we need to start thinking differently about how we handle all waste streams. And this is where we start. And there are so many options to do with this uh, around our treatment facilities, but beyond our treatment facilities, figuring out if it's better to th send things to our waste facility or maybe side stream them and take them directly to a digester or other solutions. So I want you to remember this slide. 
This is super important as we're trying to find sustainable solutions, this hierarchy of waste management. And you'll see at the top, the most preferable is source reduction. We know a large amount of our carbon footprint in our country comes from wasted food waste. Um, so remembering it starts with source reduction and I'll get a little bit into pre-treatment source control. The next thing is recycling. How can we recycle these products and reuse them beneficially? Energy recoverment, treatment, and then the lowest is disposal and other releases. So that's what we're gonna talk about in Central Oregon that we're doing land application of some resources. So I wanna start with the National Pretreatment Program because it often doesn't get a lot of recognition. They're kind of the janitors of the wastewater world. No one knows about them until something goes really wrong quite often. They're gonna become increasingly important with the new emergence of PFAS and other um, constituents. But I want you to notice the bottom bullet point. This is right off the EPA website as the purpose of the pretreatment program. Improve opportunities to recycle and reclaim municipal and industrial wastewaters and sludges. So thinking about pretreatment differently as source control, how can we reduce constituents coming to wastewater? How can we re just reduce the overall um, resources that we can recover? Um, also, so it's gonna be your pretreatment program that's gonna help with this. And we're gonna talk about fog and brewery waste particularly, but looking at all sorts of industrial waste. There are a lot of industrial waste that get hauled off as non-hazardous waste that might be able to be utilized as well thinking about industrial waste facilities where you can reclaim products and treat ahead of pretreatment into a municipal plant. So these are the waste materials we are gonna focus on today as we went into an alternatives analysis. And you'll see the, the ones with the little kind of land figure. These are currently land applied and then. So we have brewery waste that is land applied under an ag permit. It's very loosely regulated. It's a pretty decent soil amendment. The other things that are currently land applied are fat soils and grease, septic and portable toilet waste and waste activated sludge. Those are commingled into a slurry. So the fog is one third to two thirds septic and portable toilet waste. We do know that fog is not a beneficial soil amendment. It can actually damage the hydroconductivity of the soil. So it's not a sustainable practice. The number of restaurants we have, we've estimated the volume of fog application about 4 million gallons a year. So it's a lot of waste. Bend is one of the fastest growing towns in the country consistently, actually the whole region of Central Oregon. So that is a lot of waste and the land is shrinking as more waste comes available. And this is a regional problem because all the waste for the fog waste comes from multiple cities, comes through a facility at the Bend wastewater plant and is then land applied. Challenges of land application, I touched on that. So the permitting for the land application is a little bit tenuous. As I mentioned, the brewery waste is under a Department of Agriculture permit, so Often agriculture, when they get a lot of complaints, they start saying, I think DEQ needs to regulate this. And sometimes they've gone back and forth thinking that it should become an industrial waste and that would change everything on the application and the regulatory oversight. Urban growth, again, the city of Bend is growing pretty rapidly. You're having um, areas bump up against agricultural areas. So more complaints, particularly about brew waste. It smells pretty bad. Um, the first day, it kind of smells like a frat house. And then the second day, it smells like bodies decaying. That's what people have called it and told me. So it's really an unpleasant smell. Um, land acquisition. So being able to find the land to apply this to. Transportation costs. The company that currently applies this says they keep having to move further away from town. That ups their cost and their carbon footprint the agronomic application requirements. So they can only apply to the same field twice a year. So again, that limits the amount they can apply. Frozen ground, bend is frozen for a large part of the year and you're not allowed to apply to frozen ground. So I often wonder where is it going in the winter? And then crop limited. So not having the appropriate crops to apply brew waste to. 
So sustainable materials management, why we embarked on this, it aligns with our council goals. We want to reduce carbon footprint. That was a huge part of our new council's goal setting. Water conservation, reduce wastewater cost and increase capacity at the treatment plant. This could potentially bring in revenue for the utility. Currently, we pay a contractor to handle these wastes. In addition, if we could recover these wa wastes, we might be able to offset costs. Eliminate the application of brewery waste on the fields, reducing odor complaints, and improve the handling of fat, soils, and grease and septic portable toilet waste. We know that this probably isn't environmentally sustainable to apply these kind of wastes in a, from a city of our size. And then again, re reduce the fees paid to a private contact contractor. So when we embarked on this, we knew that we had to take a triple bottom line approach and not just look at the easiest or cheapest method for getting rid of these wastes. So that nexus of social, environmental, and economic um, reasons for sustainable principles. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brittany, who um, we hired Leeway Engineering to embark on the project to look at alternatives for handling these wastes in our community. Thank you, Christina. Um, before I go into this detail, I also wanna introduce one more person that was left out of the intro. So Preston Van Meter, um, he's sitting right there. He'll be up here to speak to you in a little bit. Um, he's our technical lead with West Yoast. Um, and he was also involved in, in, this, um, in this project. So um, City of Bend developed a, a program for resource recovery and they defined several goals as were based off of the, um, the goals for sustainable waste management. And uh, their goals were to decrease waste, increase re resource recovery, increase revenue generation, decrease costs, rate payers, agencies, and businesses, and increase environmental benefits. Well, this is gonna be a larger program and there's gonna be multiple stages of it. The first, first project is the alternative analysis, which we're just wrapping up now. And so this smaller part um, of the program had the goals to document current practices, what is currently being, what is currently happening with hauled waste in Central Oregon, um, evaluate alternative solutions, what else can be done with these different hauled wastes, or what we call now feedstocks because they're not waste, they're products. Um, and then encourage stakeholder collaboration. How can we get other stakeholders on board with these different sustainable solutions? And then recommend long-term solutions for sustainable resource recovery in Central Oregon. And so that was our goals for this alternative analysis. As you can see, there's many different stages of this program. Um, we're in the alternative analysis now. Um, we next there will be a master planning stage and then there'll be a design and of course there's going to be public engagement the whole way um, and then finally there'll be construction so we're looking um, this will be uh, this program will won't start construction until about two, uh, 2027 so we wanted to get stakeholders involved in early as early in the project as possible um, uh, City of Bend and Energy Trust of Oregon had already done a really great um, job reaching out to different um, stakeholders within the region. Um, you can see on the slide, all of these different um, logos are from different stakeholders within the region. These folks had already actually been engaged in, in part of um, making sure that this project um, uh, became a, a funded project by the City of Bend before it even happened. Um, so we just took up, <laughs> took that and started running with what they already created. Um, the first stage in the alternative analysis is we created a stakeholder register where we wrote down every single person that we thought had any kind of interaction with hauled waste in Central Oregon. So if they're a hauler, if they're a business owner that generated the waste, um, if they're an agency that regulated the waste, if it, there are any of the um, governing agencies within the area, um, we wanted them to be involved. And so we developed um, several different layers of um, involvement for these different stakeholders. The minimum time requirement, the first layer, um, was a survey. So we reached out to several stakeholders and asked them to um, just reply to our survey. It was part of some data collection. Um, the next level was uh, we had interviews. We conducted about 30 interviews within the region with these different stakeholders to gather even more data. Um, and then finally, we um, developed a stakeholder advisory committee. 
And so um, you can see these names on this list here. This included um, 16 different organizations and 21 individuals that um, comprise the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. And uh, for our Stakeholder Advisory Committee, we had several different workshops. And in these workshops, we um, developed the um, triple bottom line um, uh, uh, scenario that we were going to, um, uh, sorry, words. Um, that we were going to identify these different alternatives with and then figure out which one was the best option for Central Oregon. And so we wanted all these stakeholders to be involved the whole um, process of the program. And so you can see here, um, this is a flow chart showing our um, stakeholder engagement. Um, we started out with our surveys and our interviews um, in February of this year. And then after that, we moved into the stakeholder workshops. Um, we had four different uh, workshops. Um, each of the workshops had a different um, uh, reason behind it. So workshop number one was the kickoff. We shared most of the same information we've shared with you today with the stakeholders and told them what their role was and how they were gonna be involved. We also asked in that workshop, what is important to you um, for a solution? And we gathered that data and what we used for that, um, we used that data to create the criteria that was going to form the alternative analysis Workshop number two, we defined the different alternatives. So in that workshop, we came back and we, we explained the different technologies that were available to be used in the region. And we also defined um, the, the criteria that was going to be used in the triple bottom line criteria. Um, and also we had the, the alter, uh, sorry, we had the stakeholders vote on uh, what the different weighings were of the um, criteria. We'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. And then stakeholder workshop number three was review evaluation. One at, at workshop number three, we had um, done a lot of data analysis for the different um, technologies that were available, but we hadn't cited our technologies yet. And that was a key component in completing the alternative analysis. So in that workshop, we showed um, everyone the data that we had collected so far, like here's all the um, feedstocks we have in Central Oregon. Here's how much energy we can create, but we don't know where to put this. And so we used an interactive um, process with the stakeholders to kind of eliminate different places um, and uh, narrow down our different siting locations and finalize our alternatives that we're looking at. And then our final workshop in number four, um, we had the stakeholders, um, we went through and actually scored all the alternatives and came up with our final scoring and our, our preferred alternatives. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Preston. So in terms of looking at the technical analysis, um, which is probably the easier part of a project of this nature, um, you have to start with what's your design criteria. So we have this list of feedstocks and Christina and Brittany talked about them. Um, what we need to do early in the project is try to quantify them. So the city's staff spent a ton of time going out to all of these various uh, establishments all over town, trying to get us to a place where we knew volume and we knew uh, uh, treatability and the quantity of gas we could convert. Um, and we really looked at the world of possibilities in terms of feedstocks. There is a, a growing potential for food waste to be source separated uh, in town that has some legs outside of just this evaluation. So wanted to try to understand food waste um, as well as the fog and brewery waste. Something to know about brew waste in Bend. So the really high strength waste is separated and hauled, but there's a low strength waste that's still pretty high strength compared to residential waste strength. Um, that's also something that as we move forward, um, is there a, a value in trying to source separate that from all, there's just an abundance of breweries in town. Um, I think feedstocks is, is, is the key issue when we get into looking at the alternatives. Um, have we well quantified the feedstocks? What's the sensitivity of our analysis if the feedstocks are off by 25% or 100%? Um, that could shift our, our look at the alternatives. Um, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, the other thing I note is the city has partnered with Oregon State University. So they're doing some treatability studies on all the various waste streams. They've got a mini digester um, at, on campus that they're gonna run some tests on so we can actually get real gas production numbers that can help us fine tune um, our analysis. I don't know how to make this go forward. Is it this guy? Oh. Good. All right. Uh, okay. A lot of numbers, a lot of conversions. We did a lot of spreadsheet stuff. The thing to note, if you're an engineer in the room, 
the numbers for the feedstocks that we quantified comes out to about 100 SCFM. So um, if you've done co-digestion facility design and looked at gas numbers, you know that that's on the low end of, a, uh, of an engine um, and, and kind of right in the sweet spot for a micro turbine. It'll also help you start to hone in on where we think we're gonna land in terms of the recommended alternative. Um, I'm happy to talk about the conversions we used and things, but that's generally um, what we were able to quantify from the feedstocks that we know of that we used in the analysis. We had to create just a, a line in the sand. Um, this is what we're going to use for the analysis, and this is what we're going to carry through our alternatives evaluation, knowing that probably the next step coming out of the study is we've got to go back and reevaluate the feedstocks. We've got the tool set up, so it's really easy in our spreadsheets. We can just drop in new numbers, and all the alternatives will update. Um, so one of the key, so outside of the treatment process, the other big part uh, in looking at these studies is just transportation costs. Haulers work on a very low margin. They're gonna go where costs are cheapest. So we need to understand what our price point is when we're calculating revenues. Um, the area we looked at actually goes way up to past Redmond. We also looked south um, to Sun River, which is a resort south of, or, or south of Bend. And then we also looked a little bit east and a little bit west. What you see is a heat map with tipping fees from the various haulers that we use to establish the numbers that once we were able to identify where the feedstocks are coming from, we could put some tipping fees and hauling costs to those when we looked at our analyses. Um, so I'll talk quickly about kind of the four base alternatives and then I'll introduce the alternatives and I'm gonna pass it back over to Brittany and let her talk about the cool stuff, which is the results. Um, so status quo is really all of the hauled waste in Bend now goes to these lagoon systems where it's semi-stabilized, uh, lime stabilized and land applied. Christina talked about the, the difficulty of land applying fog waste, but just, I think there's general consensus in, in the region that those waste streams aren't best to be land applied, but there's, there's, there's better places for those to be utilized, especially in this, uh, the current ethos that we have for resource recovery. Um, however, we did establish a baseline alternative and we carried it through our analyses. Um, all of the alternatives center on wet digestion. So there are certainly potential dry digestion and other alternatives that could be considered. But in order to, to just compare and contrast alternatives, we centered on wet digestion. Um, we also looked at varying uh, inputs from septage and was um, if we were going to do an organics only kind of separate facility. Uh, likely we take the, the was that comes from other uh, treatment facilities. We let that still go to the city of Bend's um, wastewater treatment plant. Um, and we also were, were pretty clear going into the study that we weren't trying to get into a place where we were trying to put businesses that exist and, and want to keep to exist after the, the study's done or the project's done, that we weren't trying to figure out a way to take all of these waste streams and divert them to this new facility. It was more about how do we work together to put the, re the energy in the right place where we can convert it to a beneficial use. Um, so we did look at uh, an organics only digester. So that would be the, the food waste uh, or the fog, things that wouldn't be regulated under 50C3 regs. Um, that was kind of a separate facility, uh, potentially co-located with say, not landfill where they have a gas transmission main are thinking about an, uh, their own uh, RNG type process where we could potentially piggyback on facilities. Um, so we looked at organics only digestion with cogeneration, so with an engine or a, or a micro turbine. We looked at organics only digestion with additional gas treatment where we push it back onto the uh, natural gas system. We looked at co-digestion at the uh, Bend wastewater treatment plant. Um, if you've done these analyses before and you're an engineer in the room, you know that you probably know by now where this alternative is landing based on the gas uh, volumes that I said early on. Um, okay, so once we got done, those are the four base alternatives that we started with. Then there were some permutations that came up in consultate or in discussions with our stakeholder group. Um, there were some things going on regionally where we felt like we needed to separate out some of the alternatives and look at them individually in terms of where we could process waste or what we could do um, in terms of the alternatives. So alternative one is the status quo I talked about. Uh, alternative two was organics only digestion with cogen at not landfill, which is a landfill that's going to be retired over the next 20 years, but they're actually putting in a, a, a gas system to recover gas off of the landfill. So there was a potential partnership there that we wanted to explore. Um, there is organics only digestion uh, 
using potentially the gas treatment system that they'll be installing at Knott Landfill, um, regardless of where we land on our uh, project um, and pushing that back onto uh, gas pipeline. Uh, we looked at two co-digestion alternatives where a portion of the regional feedstocks that was and other things are diverted to the treatment plant, obviously a little bit more gas produced uh, if we have more feedstocks coming into the plant. Um, it also happens that the, the bend treatment plant is really low on digester capacity. They're probably going to be building capacity in the near term. So this is something that's, that's timely in terms of looking at their upcoming facilities plan. Um, and then uh, the last couple of alternatives came out of our, our public engagement process where we looked at uh, a, an alternate facility in Redmond where they have a, 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 an RV dump um, station and a lot, of, um, a lot of land, a lot of open land. So one of the challenges with the not landfill site and just being in Bend in general, there's lots of concerns about odors. Um, that, art, that Redmond site, there's really nothing around there. Uh, well, it's it's a lot of open land around there, so so potentially not the impacts or concerns about um, odors. Um, and then we also looked at an alternative that was recommended by one of the stakeholders, um, where we did the the digestion, the the treatment, and the gas, uh, uh, whatever we were going to do with the gas cogen or, or RNG, uh, but took the digest state off that process and had that process at the Bend facility. Um, and that's the the alternatives that are shown right there. They're numbered. Um, based on what I just talked about. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Brittany so she can talk through the TBL and then the results. Okay, we have like 12 minutes to go through all the exciting math and results. So I'll try to be quick. Um, triple bottom line. So once again, this is the framework we use to um, do the complete the analysis. All these different criteria, this is easier to explain at this location. So all these different criteria you see here were developed with our stakeholder engagement group. They're like, these are the things that we really care about. We want you to, to do some calculations for these things. We're like, cool. So we um, made all our criteria. And then once again, the stakeholder advisory group, they filled out a form on um, what was um, most important one to five um, being least important on each of these different criteria. And we used that and normalized it based on everyone's input to find out these final, um, these final weights for each of the different criteria. And so this is just our rubrics that we use to, um, to follow on our analysis. And this is what we use to calculate which um, alternative ranked the highest versus the lowest. Um, so today, oops, there he goes. Today, we obviously don't have enough time to go through all of these. I would need to you know, have you sit here for two more hours and probably none of you wanna do that after being in conference for three days. And so I'm just gonna go through some highlights. Um, feel free to contact us if you want some more details. So we're gonna go over two in the environmental, one in social and one in cost. So you just can kind of get a good idea of what we did. So environmental first one um, was beneficial use. Um, this is pretty exciting. We're able to see what kind of um, different products we could create from each of these different, um, different alternatives. Um, so currently the status quo number one, they have line stabilized solids. Um, these are applied to fields. And then there's, um, uh, energy, no energy created from that. Um, on the left axis here, you see this is the kilowatts per year created from the alternative, and on the right is um, uh, products per year. year. And so um, this line right here is your energy per year. Um, and so from the co-digestion systems, alternative number four and five, they created the most energy um, by far. And why this is, is because currently at the city of Bend wastewater treatment plant, they just flare their gas. Um, that, so that is not being reused at all. So with a co-digestion um, facility, we can capture the gas off of the biosolids that is not being utilized currently and add that with the gas that could be generated off of these different organic speed stocks. So pretty exciting. Um, that comes out to about um, enough energy to power about 500 homes per year. Um, and then the organics only um, systems are alternative two, three, six, and seven. And the highest of those is um, renewable natural gas option at the not landfill. And that generated enough power to um, uh, supply about 255 homes per year of energy. Um, and then there's other various different biosolid resources that you get off of these. Um, our, our compost is what cut is the product off of the organics only digestion. You can sell compost, you know, in stores for plants, et cetera. Um, so those you can see here, kind of the little um, 
orange columns, and then um, we get biosolids off of alternative and four and five and seven. So those are mixed with the um, wastewater treatment plant solids. Um, also beneficial use as well. Um, the next one um, is, oh, sorry, I should say, so obviously from that, the, um, the co-digestion options um, scored the highest, the organics next, and then the lowest was the status quo. Um, the next one in environmental was greenhouse gas emissions. So all of the, we, we did calculate all of the hauling emissions, the processing emissions. This is um, global warming potential per year based on the alternative. Um, added those all together and this is the results. So all of the different alternatives were very, very similar. The only one that stands out as quite a bit different is alternative five. And that's because it's at the wastewater treatment plant. And we assumed in that alternative that we'd also be accepting half of the um, chem toilet, was and um, septic receiving um, feedstocks. And that was not included in the other um, alternatives. It, we assumed in the other alternatives that those would go to the places they're currently going. So more feedstocks, more um, uh, higher global warming potential when you're processing those feedstocks. So that's a simple difference there between the other ones. You're probably like, where is number one? Number one, again, is our status quo. We're actually working with a couple of people in the industry to try to quantify um, what is the amount of um, global warming potential that comes from land application of fog? Um, we haven't completed that number right now. It's in, in we're working on it. Um, and so it's hard to find data on it because it's not a very often used um, way to deal with um, your fog waste. And then also, but we know um, quant uh, qualitatively, not quantitatively, that that is an uncontrolled source of greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, qual qualitatively, we know that's not the best practice as far as greenhouse gas emissions. We're currently working on calculating that. So if you want to read our final report in a, in a month or two, it will be in there. Um, so social and public acceptance, I mean, sorry, this one's pu public acceptance. So we defined each of these social ones, we had to define what we were going to measure as, as part of these different categories. So for public acceptance, we defined it as four different things, the proximity, proximity to residential areas, assuming that the farther away from residential areas, the better for um, due to odor control concerns, um, impacts on landscape, um, the other input was traffic impacts. Are we increasing the traffic by a lot in a residential area? Um, and then also the ability for, of haulers to apply biosolids on local lands. So the two um, items that were differentiators here is the proximity to residential areas. All, most of our sites were good. They're out far, they're, there's no issues, except for at the not landfill. The not landfill is conveniently located right across the street from a school. So it's very close to um, a residential area and a school um, public exposure. So that alternatives that are located at the um, not landfill, we scored lower. Um, and then also the ability for haulers to apply bottle of solids while our current status quo, um, alternative number one, um, they are already at, they need more fields. Um, they're at capacity and they are having trouble finding more fields because of the public perception of land application on those fields. So we already know that public perception is limiting the land application of those line stabilized solids in Central Oregon. So we, we scored that option lower because of that issue. Um, and then of course, composting is, is the most accepted by the public, so those scored highest. Um, costs. Um, so we uh, use operation, maintenance cost, um, revenue cost, and capital cost, and, and calculated a simple payback for each of our alternatives. We kept number one off of here because that's like comparing rent to a mortgage. It just is not apples to apples. Um, so alternative um, number four and five were the um, lowest simple payback, and those are for the code digestion at um, the treatment plant. We were super excited to see that there was a simple payback less than 20 years, which means this is penciling out well. Um, also to mention that this simple payback does not include grants. We just assumed what we know we will create from um, revenue without grants as like the worst case scenario for these. So there's actually a ton of other funding um, possibilities that aren't even included in this and it's still looking this feasible.
Um, so the results of the triple bottom line, um, this is what we came up with. We, once again, we used um, each of the criteria. We worked with our stakeholders, showed them the data, had them help us assign the different scores for each of the criteria. And this is what came out as a ranking. So um, alternative five, which is co-digestion with septage at the wastewater treatment plant scored the highest. Alternative four is um, co-digestion at the wastewater treatment plant that does not include any septage receiving. That, that assumes that the septage um, that currently is going to other places in Central Oregon will continue to go to where it is going. And then, so that was all ranked number two. And number three um, was um, renewable natural gas at the not landfill. So that's in collaboration with our gas capture project that is already underway at the, at the not landfill. Um, so those came out as the top three alternatives from, from the results. One more thing we wanted to do. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we wanted to do a sensitivity analysis. So we had a, as Preston mentioned, draw the line in the sand um, and make our assumptions for the um, alternative analysis. And one of those assumptions was that we would only um, receive the feedstocks that are currently being hauled. Well, we know that the breweries, a lot of the breweries are not hauling their high strength waste. They're putting it into the sewer. So that is a huge amount of feedstock that is not counted for in this um, analysis. And then also our, um, our food composting program in Central Oregon is at capacity. They compost at the landfill, it's a really cool program in, um, in collaboration with the um, environmental center. Um, and so because of that capacity, they're not able to expand on it right now. So if we had a new facility for um, regional resource recovery, we could expand on that program. And so we wanted to make sure if we um, had a huge increase in um, high strength brewery waste and in um, our food waste that our um, alternatives would still turn out um, the same order. Um, and so when we did that, this is the um, simple payback of um, of the alternative. So the green line you can see is without those additional feedstocks. And obviously if you add more feedstocks, you, you make more money, you make more revenue for tipping fees. And so things get paid back quicker, which is good news. And so um, we looked at the different alternatives and um, it's still good news. Um, our alternative number um, four and five were still the, the um, highest ranking for, um, for cost, even with that sensitivity analysis. Um, and so that was good news. We also we know that there's some place concrete for construction of um, digestions is um, systems is expensive. So there's some point where um, the industrial um, organics only digestion systems will be cheaper if you have enough feed stocks. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we weren't not going to hit that tipping point in this um, confirmed that we were not going to. Um, and so our key conclusions um, is that one, um, we want to shift the perception in Central Oregon, looking at looking at waste pro as products and resources. Um, also, big picture thinking. When you're looking at your master planning for solutions, um, increase your collaboration with private partnerships within the part, uh, master planning efforts, and also look behind your jurisdictional boundaries for um, solutions. And you know, obviously, with more collaboration, the better ideas um, you will come into. Also. Um, the status quo was the, the least preferable option um, from the alternatives analysis. And then co-digestion at the bin wastewater treatment plant is um, the most preferable option. Um, we also recommend to explore private partnerships um, in particular with this project that was with Cascade Natural Gas um, for a gas capture project. Um, and then um, explore public, and, and then the last one is collaborative policy making, and Christina is gonna talk a little bit more on that. So yeah, to wrap it up, how do you get these projects done? And how do you think this way holistically engaging all the stakeholders to make a better project and better solution? So I like this integrated resource recovery. How do we get there? So what I've found working with industries is they're often now more progressive than the city they're in, imagine that. And they wanna be very green and sustainable. Um, the day of social media, these companies wanna advertise that they're doing things well. As soon as they do something bad, it's all over the place, right? We know quickly and people react, consumers react. So what we often find is that you have these companies, if you look at the th first three, they have these internal actions. They're trying to do resource recovery. They're trying to be environmentally sustainable. 
what happens is they bump against the governance or the policymakers. You have to have the community buy-in, you have to have the policymakers incentivizing these things or it doesn't go anywhere. Um, we had an interesting project that came out of this limited land application, Deschutes Brewery, who is the biggest land applier of um, beer waste. So five to six truckloads a day of brewery waste, very high strength waste is land applied. They were afraid that the ag permit was gonna get pulled as I mentioned. And they were also afraid that they couldn't, the company that was handling it couldn't keep up with the truck traffic if they increased their production. So it really limited their production. Again, we're keeping this waste out of our treatment plant. And those are decisions you have to make as well. There are some cities that want all that waste coming to the treatment plant. So again, these are policy level decisions that you have to engage with your industry. Look at all these waste streams. So um, that's in closing, just thinking about public private partnerships. There are a lot of incentives for them to find ways to resource recovery and that you're working with them in your community. Um, so finish up, I just want to leave you with that idea of biosolids. We know how hard it is to get rid of municipal biosolids, yet it's pretty easy to, um, in Central Oregon, apply a slurry of fog, portable toilet, and fog waste. So um, just thinking about that. And thanks for staying and listening. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. So given that your solution is a regional solution, did you have to get everyone under some type of agreement that they will, will do this so that no one you know, goes off and does their own thing down the road after you've designed the system? Um, we, we didn't go down that route because this is more of just an idea of seeing what alternatives were out there. I think that would come through as we went into a feasibility study, um, but we did have really good collaboration. So uh, Cascade Natural Gas, very interested. We, like we said, OSU was, was supporting the project right from the beginning, um, all the cities. So this is a waste problem for the, the cities surrounding us, Lapine, Sun River, Sisters, Redmond. Uh, so it was engaging multiple municipalities in this for the best solution, as well as uh, industries and, and possible partners that could benefit from this. So again, the gas companies right now are very interested in this. Brittany can speak to the fact that um, Central Oregon Electric, where all the options are, it doesn't really pencil out as well for electric. If we were in a different, if we were in Pacific Power, it would, but she can speak more to that. We run out of time, but I'm sure they will be happy to um, answer any questions individually. Thank you very much for coming.